I've never heard them before. Did you do that? No. No, they must have. Somebody did. It was, it was really, really good. We're going to be talking about all for the glory of God this morning, if we only could understand that. I'll show you what I mean in just a moment. Um, how many of you have ever had one of these uh, psychological tests, you know, where they, any of you? Maybe you had to take them to get into school? Huh? Yeah. There was one, the MMPI, that I had to take for my doctoral course in seminary. And, and the one thing I, I remember about it is it kept asking, do you feel like somebody is watching you? Do you feel like somebody is following you? Do you and I bet it must have asked that question five times. And finally, about the last one, just because I was so irritated with it, I put, yes, yes, I do. I don't know what that did to the test, but I sure was tired of seeing it. Well, this morning, I want to talk about psychological tests, and this is not working for me this morning. I thought maybe it was because I had not turned it on. Let's turn it off, and then we'll turn it on again. There. What is your personality type? I could answer that for you, but... Probably it would be better for you to answer it for yourself. What kind of person are you? Uh, what kind of personality do people think you have? Somebody came up with um, Christmas songs that are put together for certain personality types. I thought you might find this interesting. Uh, certain, and by the way, one of them is secular. I apologize for that. You know how the world does Christmas songs. Schizophrenia, okay? Schizophrenics are people who, you know, think people are talking about them and they're hearing voices and so forth. There's a song for them. Do you hear what I hear? <laughs> Multiple personality disorder. We three kings disoriented are. <laughs> yeah, all three of us. <laughs> <laughs> dementia, when you stop remembering things. I'll be home for Christmas, if I can remember. <laughs> Narcissistic, that's when you think you're the most beautiful, you're just the greatest. Uh-huh. Hark the herald angels sing about me. <laughs> Mania, mania. <laughs> Almost like obsessive compulsive. Deck the halls and walls and house and lawn and streets and stores and office and town with boughs and boughs of holly. <laughs> We've got some of you like that, actually. <laughs> oh, here, here's a good one. Paranoia. Santa Claus is coming to get me. <laughs> Personality disorder. You better watch out. I'm going to cry. I'm going to pout. Then maybe I'll tell you why. Finally, obsessive compulsive, you know, the person who just has to get it all done and right. Oh, come all ye faithful, come now, come quickly, come, 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 yeah. Well, I don't always know what type of personality people are, even after I've talked with them a while, but this morning, we're going to be talking about God's personality. Now, I'm not going to mention it for several minutes, and you may forget that we're talking about that, but you'll see why it fits in just a moment. Uh, next week, I'll show you how all of this passage fits together, but this morning, I'm only taking one little verse out of the section, which is a, a fantastic thought, one which we ought to remember and one which talks all about the glory of God, and then next time we're together, I'll put it together for you. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 15 through 33. If I speak, or pardon me, I speak as to wise men, you judge what I say. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. 
Look at the nation Israel. Are, are not those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar? What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything? He's going back to his, his subject of some believing you could eat meat that had been offered to idols and some didn't believe that. So he's picking up that thought again. Uh, do I mean that a thing sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. Uh, but I, I say the, the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and, and not to idols, not to God. And I don't want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We're not stronger than he, are we? All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking uh, questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you want to go, eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this meat is offered or sacrificed to idols, do not eat it. For the sake of, I'm sorry, I lost my place. For conscience sake. And by the way, you keep seeing me turn over here. It's because somebody's head keeps getting in my way back there. But no, you're fine now. I, I can look over here. <laughs> hey, I'm just glad we've got it back there. Um, he says, do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you. And for conscience sake. I mean, not your own conscience. But the other man's, for why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. Now, there is a lot in this passage. But what I want to focus on this morning is that one thought there. Whether then you eat or drink or, or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. It's a, it's a verse most of us know. It, it, it's something that most of us say, amen, yeah, oh, that's good. But look at that word, glory. What is glory? You know, it's one of those words we use a lot. It's a word like hope or faith or Mercy or grace, words we use a lot, and we don't always know really what they mean. What is glory? That's what we want to ask this morning, talking about the glory of God. Uh, what, what does it mean? The, the glory of God can be seen. God is glorious. And, and, and when, when it says we're to give glory to God, how do you do that? How do I glorify God. Well, what does all of this mean? The scripture is, is filled with, with talk about the glory of God. I'm only going to mention a few passages. Obviously, the Psalms mention the glory of God a lot. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Psalm 29, verses 1 and 2. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Psalm 57, verse 5. Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above all the earth. 
And then we go all the way to the end of the Revelation. Again, many passages in between here. And the city, the city of God, the new Jerusalem, heaven, has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. That's all great stuff, but what is glory? Whatever God's glory is, Moses wanted to see it. I mean, Moses said, you know, I, I've, I've talked with you, Lord. I've, I, I met you at the burning bush, and, and I followed you, and, and I do what you tell me to do. But, but then there came that time when Moses said in Exodus 33, 18, show me your glory. What's he talking about? Well, what was he expecting to see? God answered him. God said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and, and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. And then that strange passage where it says he put him in the cleft of the rock and covered him with his hands and he, he, he went by and uh, Moses could see his back parts. I don't know what that means. If you do, please let me know. But what I find interesting here is Moses says, show me your glory. And God said, uh, I'm compassionate and I'm good and I'm this and I'm that and I'm the other. That must have something to do with his glory. When Moses asked to see God's glory, he passed by and he recounted to him his attributes, his characteristics, so to speak. So when we talk about the glory of God, it basically is his attributes or characteristics. If we use it of someone, we say it's their, their characteristics, what, what is about them. Um, theologian Charles Ryrie called it the personality of God. What is God's personality like? It's his, it's his glory. Now, because that word is also used of how God manifests his glory in ways that people see certain things, it also has to do with, with the physical representation of God's personality. We think of it as light and glory and, and, and bright stuff, but, but it basically is who he is, what he's all about, God's glory. But then you have to ask, what does it mean to glorify God? If his glory is his personality, if his glory is who he is and what he is about in life, how do I glorify him? I obviously can't add to who he is. I can't make him more of anything. What does it mean then to glorify God? Well, I want to suggest to you this morning that there are two ways to glorify God, two specific ways. Perhaps you can think of other ways to say this. But I think this fits what Scripture says. One way to glorify God is simply by properly responding to his personality. By properly responding to who he is. Uh, there are ways that you treat certain people. There are ways you respond to those that you know. There are certain ways that you respond to someone who is a dignitary. There, there are certain ways that you respond to those who are wealthy and, and have power. Just different ways that we respond to personalities. So let's talk about responding to God and his personality. And you think about how people responded when they saw God. I can only go through a couple of examples because of time this morning, but Job saw God, at least saw his glory, saw some manifest, talked with him, whatever, however you want to put it. Now, Job thought 
He knew how he would respond when he saw God. Job was a little upset. Job was really ticked off because he had lost all ten children. He had lost all of his wealth, everything he had. Three friends came to sit with him, and they basically say, Job, it's all your fault. You're, you're, you've got sin in your life, and because of that, uh, God has punished you. In the chapter I'm going to take you to, it's hard to see unless I explain it to you, but it is a courtroom drama. All of the words in, in this particular passage of, of Job 31 are, are picturing a courtroom that has been set up, and, and Job, as, as one of the attorneys, gets up and, and makes this response. Job 31, 35. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Behold, here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. Here's my complaint. Okay, we're, we're here. Justice is going to be done. God, this is what you've got to answer to, and it's my complaint. Oh, Job, don't say that. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Well, you remember the story. <clears throat> God appeared, or he showed up. However you want to say it, anthropomorphically or whatever, his presence comes about in Job 38, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Why is that significant? Because it was the whirlwind, you remember, that took the lives of all ten of Job's children. Uh, significantly, God shows up in the whirlwind. And he said, who is this? that darkens counsel by words without knowledge. Now gird up your loins like a man. I will ask you, and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know? Job, you're questioning me. I have a few questions for you you have any idea what you're talking about? Do you know anything about this world that you're in? Uh, then we have Job's answer after seeing God. Job 42. Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I retract. <laughs> I take it all back. I, I'm sorry I said it. Oh, wish I hadn't uttered those words. I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. You see, Job uh, could respond to God's glory because God showed himself as he really is. He is God. He's God. Job, who are you to ask me what I'm doing? Let me remind you of another man who saw God. Wonderful picture of, of God in the temple in the, the days when um, a great king had died, and uh, it says Isaiah saw God. This is how he responded, Isaiah 6. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. And the seraphim called out to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Yeah, you, you would think he would say, Holy, 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 the whole earth is full of his holiness. But no, that's just one of his attributes. The whole earth is, is full of his attributes, full of who he is, full of what he has done. Isaiah 
saw God. This is his response. Then I said, woe is me, for I'm ruined. Um, King James, I think, says I, I've, I am undone. Uh, it means like I, I'm, I'm coming apart at the seams. I, I, in seeing God, I, man, I just don't really measure up. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You see, to glorify God is to properly respond to it. Not just to respond, but to properly respond to him. Folks, he is not the man upstairs. I get so tired of hearing that. In fact, there are times I guess I've been rude about it. But he's not the man upstairs. There's not a man upstairs. Be glad he's not a man. I think of this passage back in Hosea chapter 11 where, where God's people had moved away from him. They had disobeyed him. And, and he says, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I surrender you, O Israel? He should have. They were disobedient. How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? Those were places that he had judged. My heart is turned over within me. All my compassions are kindled. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not destroy Ephraim again, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst. The reason I don't destroy you is because I'm God. Can you imagine what it would be like if a man were upstairs? I've learned over the years not to say, can you imagine what it would be like if there were a woman upstairs? I get in trouble every time I say that. But, I mean, you know how you are. It says 20 items or less. And you start counting. Go to hell, go directly to hell, do not pass go, do not collect $200. Somebody pulls in, for, yeah, all these, ooh, if we were in charge, but we're not. See, he's, he's God and not a man. And, and to glorify God is to properly respond to him. And I, I think it's an obvious question then, do I glorify God? Do I respond properly to him? When, when, when we come together as, as a church, when we have a time of worship, do I? Do I worship? Let me think about it. Do you know what worship means, by the way? Worship comes from two Anglo-Saxon words. We are f which means worth, and scopas, or skipe is the way it is in Anglo-Saxon, but it's to scope out, to look at, to see. So worship is to see the worth of something. So when we worship, we are admitting the worth of God. He is worthy. That's why in the book of the Revelation, it's worthy, worthy, worthy is he. He's worthy of of, of what we sing, what we say, and, and yet, do I even think about the words that I'm singing? Do, do, do I really? I mean, do I sit and think, glorious things of thee are spoken, and going through what God, what a privilege to carry everything to him in prayer, my Jesus, I love thee. And yet, stop and think about it. If camera were focused on me during worship, what would my body language communicate? My Jesus, I love thee. Know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. Uh, yeah. Mm. Do 
I worship? It's a real question. It's, a, it's kind of a real get-to-you kind of question, too, because, you know, you think of how many times your mind goes into neutral when it ought to be preparing us for... You, you know, people say, well, I didn't get anything out of worship. You're not supposed to get anything out of worship. He's supposed to get something out of worship. It's not about you. It's not about me. Did he get anything out of worship? Did I properly respond to, to who he is, what he's about? There's a second way to glorify God, I would suggest to you. The first one is by properly responding to his personality. The second is by properly representing his personality. By, by properly representing him. We are his ambassadors. We are the ones who are left here to testify of him. Do you know what Gandhi said about Christians? Now, people raise Gandhi up as a great man of godliness. No, I don't think Gandhi's going to be in heaven, but uh, people would call me judgmental of that. But... Uh, Gandhi said, uh, I like your Christ. I don't like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Well, in some ways, that's often true. In fact, people will say of us sometimes, if that's what it means to be a Christian, <laughs> I don't want to have anything to do with it. How well do we represent him? Several years ago, the Imperials sang a song that really emphasizes that theme. I don't know if you heard it. I don't know if you know the song, but, but it asks this question. If not in you, I, I wonder where will they ever see the one who really cares? If not from you. How will they find there's one who heals the broken heart and gives sight to the blind? And then the chorus. You're the only Jesus some will ever see. You're the only words of life some will ever read. So let them see in you the one in whom is all they'll ever need. Because you're the only Jesus some will ever see. So what do they think about him because of me? What do they think about him because of, of you. I thought about these words the other night when we were having the congregational meeting because it was wonderful to see so many people here and, and, and such a, a, a wonderful atmosphere. And uh, the only problem is, and I need to tell you something I noticed. I, I noticed it not just then, but I, I notice it many times we have big get-togethers. I notice it a lot when we have the get-togethers down at the park. And I got to tell you, this is going to sting a bit. Um, I wonder if Jesus would feel the way we do sometimes when we say, they didn't sign up. See, we had a bunch of kids here. The response of many was kind of like, why are they here? They're just going to disrupt this. Instead of, fantastic, we got so many kids here. When we meet at the park, and somebody sees we're there, and they, they come over, and they, they want to get a hamburger too. Don't get me wrong. I, I know from our personality sometimes we who like everything in order and we want it a certain way. And it, okay, I understand that. But how would Jesus do it? How would he respond to people? Um, I've often said, and by the way, the question is, do, do we run out of food? Not usually. Um, 
Could we be lovely and kind and gracious? Yeah, we could. Um, here's, here's a problem. Um, do you think the kind of response we give to situations like that represents his personality? Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're, you're, some of you might be thinking, well, who do you think you are to say such hateful words to us? Pastor, you're really getting a bit much lately because you keep bringing up negatives. Okay, I, I want to say a couple of things. Number one, I'm the pastor, one of them. I try to say pastoral things. I try to, try to say them gently, and I try to say the. But James would, you know, James, how he wrote, he would say, brothers, these things ought not to be. I mean, that, that's what I try to say. And in fact, if it were just one or two people each time, I would go directly to one or two people. But the way my memory's getting, I can't always remember after something happens who said what, where, but I, I get the sense that certain things get said. And I want to admit that I have erred in bringing these issues up in the insider. Let me tell you what I mean. My way of dealing with things is anytime it comes up, I'm going to probably mention it. Because like James says, brothers, these things ought not to be. And then I discovered that some people who read The Insider think this is the most hateful, grumpy, gripey people in the world. Now, that was my problem. I caused that. See, what you need to understand is, no, 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 that is not this group of people. This is the most gracious, wonderful group of people I've ever been with. That's why when I see certain things like that happen, I want to bring them up so we catch them quickly and we don't become this sort of thing. So don't think I'm being hateful to you. And you do remember, I always tell you, if you see me doing that, well, if you see me doing that, you do tell me. <laughs> Quite honestly, you do. Uh, and you shouldn't see me doing those kinds of things. But do I represent Jesus? Well, let's continue looking at how to represent him. See, there are two ways we should properly represent him, and one, one, people love. People love it when we show his love for sinners. Now, we don't always do that. We don't always. We say, oh, you know, hate the sin, love the sinner. But by our actions, we kind of show that we hate both. Not always. In fact, I say to you, I, again, I've never been in a church this, this gracious and wonderful. Doesn't mean we're not humans. We are. We do wrong things sometimes. But people do love it when we show his love for sinners. And when I see some people come in here sometimes, and I've been in churches where they would see some of our, our folks come in and they'd go, and you don't. You guys go and you meet them and you ask them to sit by you and uh, that's wonderful. But you know, there's the other side. We should also represent him in his hate for sin. The world doesn't like it when we do that. No, 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 they don't. That's when they call us judgmental. That's when they say we are hateful. And Jesus warned us about that. You remember? He did. He said in John 15, verses 18 through 21, If the world hates you, you know that it's hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. Oh, they loved it when Jesus healed people. They hated it when he drove the money changers out of the temple. And they will love us when we're good and kind and gracious, but they won't love us when we hate sin. And yes, it is difficult to make the distinction between love the sinner, hate the sin, all of those things. 
To glorify God is to properly respond to him. And to glorify God is to properly represent him. You know, that's what communion is all about. It is to properly respond to him and it is to properly represent him. And so I would suggest to you this morning that we should use this time to glorify him together. That's why we call it communion, uh, unity, getting together around who he is and, and what he has done. You do know what he has done, don't you? Died for our sins. Um, even when we were sinners, he gave his life. Even now, as believers, even when we can be sometimes hateful and forgetful and self-centered, he loves us. Why would you come and celebrate his love for us, his concern and his, his care that he showed on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took of the elements of the Passover meal, gave the disciples a wonderful object lesson. Taking the bread, he broke it. That is not symbolic of his body being broken because the Word of God says not one of his bones would be broken, but it is symbolic of the fact that there's part for each of us. And so we take of the bread and we, we remember the fact that he had a literal human body. He, the eternal God. How can it be? I don't know. But he, the eternal God, became flesh so that he might be the proper sacrifice for us. Let's remember that together. Gentlemen, will you serve us, please? Doesn't seem very glorious, does it? Doesn't shine 
It doesn't kind of move around in the communion tray. But what does it say about the personality of God? Well, it says that although he existed in the form of God, he thought it not a thing to be grasped after to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. It's made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself unto death. He, he died for us. This is glorious. It tells us a lot about the personality of the God-man. Let's remember together. And of course, if anything, blood does not seem very glorious. It seems everything but that, but the fact that he shed his blood for us shows us what a loving God he was. Gentlemen, would you serve us, please? I wonder why it is that people always think that they just got to be good enough to please God and get into his heaven when he tells us very plainly you can't be good enough all of your all of your righteousnesses are as filthy rags and, and it's all right people, people have told me I can't come to your church because I'm a, I'm a sinner Hey, then you fit perfectly. That's why we're here. You fit perfectly because that's why the Savior came. That's why he gave of his body, and that's why his blood was shed for your sins to make it possible for you to live forever in his heaven. 
Let's remember that together. Thank you, gentlemen. I do want to remind you that even though the message this morning was not particularly aimed at you who may not know the Savior, the invitation is always open for you to come. We have counselors who will be at the front to say to them, I, I, I need the Savior too. I need you.